The first thing I'd like to do is to thank uh, Bloomberg Green and Mark Bloomberg in particular. And we're very proud indeed that we should be part of um, this um, series. Now look, let me say something about our family. The founder of our family, Mar Amschel Rothschild, lived in Frankfurt in a one-story large room house with 17 other people. And I'll just read you something which Goethe said about the ghetto in Frankfurt at that time. The confinement, the dirt, the swarm of people, the accents of an unpleasant tongue, all made a disagreeable impression, even when one only looked in when passing outside the gate. It's a long time before I ventured in alone, and I didn't return easily after once escaping the obtrusiveness of so many people untiringly intent on haggling, either demanding or offering. So, let, let's look kind of at the history of our family for a bit since those days in the ghetto. I mean, I spent, they spent, I think, the first part of the 19th century making lots of money. I think they spent a lot of the second half of the 19th century spending it. They built altogether 44 houses. Um, they collected like mad. Uh, they bought lots of land. And then came the 20th century with two world wars, high taxation. And of those 44 houses, only one really remains with its collections intact, visited by 450,000 people a year. And around the actual manor house, there are 5,500 acres of land, which we look after. So there couldn't be a bigger difference uh, between <laughs> how things were in the ghetto and how things were by the end of the 19th century and how you can start seeing the problems of the 20th century. Now today, we're blessed. We have this incredible property. We have a collection of um, 25,000 works of art. <clears throat> we have 400, as I was saying earlier, we have 450,000 visitors. A characteristic, I think, of English heritage properties is that they tend to look backwards. And our ambition here is much more to look forwards, um, or to accompany the past, at least. And um, we care passionately about climate change. And how does that reflect itself? Well, we built this building 12 years ago, and we <clears throat> convene here and talk about these issues. So we did one with the Smith School in Oxford. Um, we've done others, and about 10 years ago now, we did a thing with Oxford University with Bill Clinton and David Attenborough to talk about climate change. But the problem, I'm afraid, gets bigger and bigger and bigger and harder and harder to deal with. I mean, if you take, it reminds me a little bit of the problems of corona, because if you take, um, take China, I mean, a few years ago, they were 3% <clears throat> of carbon emissions. Today, they're 27%, and we all mind. But then you say to yourself, well, at the same time, they took 2 billion people um, out of poverty. So how much do you sacrifice on climate change in order to bring people out of poverty? It's a big question. But what one is absolutely sure of is that there's an immense amount to do, and we're trying to do our bit here. And you might, Hannah, like to talk a bit about the farming side. Of course. It's, I mean, it's so interesting hearing about the historical context of the family because, of course, our interest in climate change goes back many hundreds of years. If you think about your grandfather, Charles, my great-grandfather, who after all was one of the first conservationists uh, in, in the world, actually. Do you remember his story and, and how he started? Because it's rather amazing. Charles, well, yes. I mean, Charles, um, 
Wozniak's, he was the father figure of uh, Nature Conservancy. And in 1914, there was a famous meeting at the Natural History Museum when he put his hat into the ring, bought a large nature reserve. And from then on, there were 284 more. So he was a crucial figure. And our side of the family, that's been consistent because his eld his eld the elder brother, Walter, who was a very eccentric man, gave Walter Rothschild, who built the museum at Tring, he um, devoted his life to wildlife, to put it simply, and animals. Um, so there was that strong tradition, which was carried on by my aunt Miriam, who also devoted her life to wildlife and <clears throat> nature. My father was a scientist. So you see increasing concerns uh, in the century. And perhaps it was the expense of banking, <laughs> but equally now, of course, one of the things in addition to those that I very briefly described, we do think a lot about is how can we invest our resources to good effect to help with climate change. And I think there are any number of ways. I mean, you can support venture capital and people who are taking worthwhile initiatives. Our dream is if you look across this building to the building on the other side, that one day that will become a center of, say, agricultural technology, ag tech, and of venture capital, which will help with climate change. So this place, we hope, will become a center uh, for those activities. And let me be frank, we've come to that conclusion, helped us by the evidence that's been mounting over the last um, decades, but also, frankly, I think because of the Bloomberg Green Initiative, it's made us try harder. So I think picking up from something that you've said, I think we feel as a family that we're custodians of the land. We don't own it. We're not here to maximise our returns. What we feel is that we've got to leave it in a better shape for the next generation. And once upon a time, I think there was a kind of pressure, you know, that people who were seen as climate change activists or people who wanted to farm in that way had to wear sackcloths and eat lentils and, you know, trips around mm. in the moonlight. But actually, what we've discovered here through our farming practices on the 5,000 acres around where we're sitting is that you can do an enormous amount to regenerate the soil actually in-house. Yeah. So, for example, you know, we harvest our rainwater. We make sure that the three quarters of a million metres of hedgerow are properly planted to help insects and wildlife. Um, we have photovoltaic um, cells, you know, to, to, to gather uh, sunlight. Uh, and we make this wonderful microbiome um, mixture that we put back into the soil. And there's another point, too, which is even the builder of Wadsden in the 1880s, he, I didn't know this until the other day, but he created 40 woods. And I think it's fair to say that in our generation, We've also created about yes. 40 woods. I mean, you've, you've planted at least 40 and woods, that, yeah, and which has been incredibly know, exciting. Yeah, it, it, It's crucial to carbon emission, yeah. emissions. And what we do with those woods are marvellous. So we take the, the dead wood out of the woods that both you know, our forebears planted and that you're planting, and we make charcoal. And that charcoal goes back into this wonderful mulch that we then put back into the land. Sure. And in many ways, we're, we're actually farming the land going back, you know, many, many hundreds of years, long before we existed, using crop rotation, using animals, putting things back into the soil. And I think both you and I share this um, belief that, in a way, instant gratification is the worst thing that you can do. So in other words, if you want to have a really fast turnover of crops, you can drown the soil with um, chemicals. Or you say, actually, mm. what we're interested in is the quality of what we grow. Yeah. And we don't drown the chemical, you know, we don't drown it in chemicals. So I think that you can do an, a hell of a lot by, you know, by not necessarily causing a revolution. I quite agree. I mean, I think the sort of fight against fertilizers, we can demonstrate to children in this area that it rarely has an impact and means something. Yeah, I mean, we, none of us would want to kind of get our breakfast cereal and pour a whole lot of chemicals on it and then go yummy 
And we wouldn't want to do that with our land either. And look, we're very lucky, I think. We have this land. We have the opportunity to make a difference. And we're doing it. But we're not kind of doing it in a Marie Antoinette, Petit Trianon way. We're actually producing crops each year and we're producing livestock. But we're doing it in a sustainable, regenerative way. No, it's fantastic. I mean, if it makes a profit, you give it. And we also, if it does make a profit, it does sometimes, we give it back, frankly. Absolutely. And I love the fact that you are so forward thinking, you know, in business. So I love the fact that we're thinking about creating an agritech centre over there, that we're actually using, for example, the latest technology, say, with drones. So we're using drones to fly over the land to see mm. where one might need a chemical, but it's only used in a tiny, tiny, tiny amount because drone technology can help us. I mean, I think the phenomenal change that's come about in the last two, three years is there probably isn't a child over the age of six that isn't deeply concerned about climate change. I mean, there were reports in the past, but now the focus of the world are on those problems whether it's droughts, whether it's storms, whether it's the seaside being ruined, Absolutely. just undermining life. Everything. And, and in a way, Corona has slightly, I'm afraid, eclipsed the importance of this conversation. No one's saying Corona isn't incredibly devastating, but actually we do need to think long term about the planet. Yeah, and it's a distraction, well, more than a distraction, it's a tragedy, but uh, it does have that knock-on effect. I mean, I would hope that um, the vision that we are coming up with here, which is that we've got land which we can look after very well and set an example, you know, not in a proselytizing way, but I hope in a attraction rather than promotion. Mm -hmm. We've got these extraordinary buildings, one of which we're sitting in now, and one, as you pointed out, where we can convene the latest and the greatest thinkers, and thanks to people like Bloomberg Green and other, yeah. um, uh, you know, other... Um, organizations um, so that we can bring and we've got the history so we can bring those three strands together I think and try and make a difference. It's incredible what Bloomberg Green has done and what Mark Bloomberg has done in this area. It really, I think, is as important as the government and intra-government um, initiatives like the Stern Report 20 years ago, like Kyoto, like Paris. I mean, you now have almost every single human being in the world deeply concerned about climate change. And I think Greenberg Green, Green has really put the focus on the problem in the most remarkable way, has made a huge contribution. So of course next year we're planning to have Bloomberg Green, you know, here in person rather than virtually. It's lovely having everyone here virtually, but what we really want to do is to welcome everyone here, show them what we're up to, and use our power to convene and cajole and entertain, I think, to give yeah. everyone a really interesting time and, and to produce some tangible results. That's right. No, we're hoping that there'll be about 500 people who will be all interested in this subject and who will contribute to it, and it's a great opportunity for us. No, it's really exciting. I think it'll be fantastic. Mm -hmm.